I just finished watching the magnificent South Korean television series, The Good Bed Mother. Following a, an attempted assassination, a 34-year-old man is reduced to the mental age of seven and forced to live again with his mother. And there, in the new relationship, new old relationship, everything comes to the surface. All the unresolved conflicts, all the grudges, all the love and all the hatred, the ambivalence, the aggression pent up and expressed, the dynamics between mother and son. A stunning series for those of you who are interested in psychology, human psychology, and or narcissism. And this is precisely the topic of today's video. Many of you have been asking me, why doesn't the narcissist settle his accounts with his biological mother? Why doesn't he simply revert to the primary object, to the initial caregiver? Why doesn't he resolve early childhood conflicts with a person who has provoked them in the first place? In short, why doesn't the narcissist tackle his issues in tandem with his mother, whether dead in a physical sense or alive? The mother, the narcissist, mother of origin, his biological mother, leaves a trace in his mind. It's known as an introject. Why doesn't the narcissist interact with this introject if his mother is, is dead or with his real mother? If she's still alive? Why does he bother to go through the hyper complex process of locating a potential intimate partner, converting her into a substitute mother, reenacting with her all the dynamics of the early relationship with his real mother in his childhood, and then attempting to separate from her? by rendering her an enemy or a persecutory object, devaluing her, discarding her. Why all this mess? <laughs> Why does the narcissist need all this mess? It's inefficient. If, and if there's one thing we know about biology and psychology, especially evolutionary psychology, is that we are efficient. If something is not useful anymore, it withers and dies away. If anything can be done, it will be done with minimal investment. For example, we invest minimally in our cognitive processes. Even though, had we invested more, we would have been able to attain better outcomes, we still invest minimally, the path of least resistance. And so why in this particular case does the narcissist defy everything we know about psychology and biology and evolution and actually goes the long, torturous, torturous way, rather than simply picking up the phone and say, Mom, I got to talk to you. We have a few unresolved issues, you know. Well, today I'm going to explain to you why, and I'm going to do it in two parts. The first part is for laymen. It's shorter and I hope more understandable or comprehensible. Comprehensive. The comprehensive and comprehensible. Now, the second part is for professionals, and it includes an overview of Margaret Mahler's theory of separation individuation. An in-depth interview. Finally, many of you have been asking me, what is separation? What is individuation? We keep using these words. You keep explaining them in layman's terms, but we are not getting it. There's no depth. Well, today I'm going to provide the depth. I'm going to describe separation individuation as a part of a much larger process of growing up, and I'm going to describe it in minute details. Now, it's not for everyone, I think, but it's up to you. You may find it fascinating, even though you're not mental health practitioners or psychology majors. It is a fascinating process that unfolds in each and every human being's mind from age zero to age three. Each and every one of us go through these phases. And when these phases are disrupted, when they go awry, this is when 
mental illness erupts and remains with us lifelong. My name is Sam Wagner and I'm the author of Malignance of Love, Narcissism Revisited. And with this new haircut, I am a former visiting professor of psychology and currently on the faculty of SIAPS. I hope they don't eject me on account of this. Okay, Shoshanim and Shoshanot, let's start by asking a simple question. The narcissist's mother of origin, his biological mother, or the person in his life who has fulfilled the role of a mother, could be a grandmother, for example, could be a father, anyone who fulfilled the maternal role. So the mother of origin in the narcissist's life, in his childhood, especially early childhood, between the ages of zero and three, months, and three years, she is a source of frustration, of hurt, of pain, of shame, of rage, of fear, terror, because she's unpredictable and arbitrary and capricious, of yearning and sadness because she's absent, self-centered, uh, self depressed. And all these, the frustration, the hurt, the shame, the rage, the sadness, all these are unconscious. The child represses them. The child cannot allow himself to experience these emotions consciously because they are likely to provoke aggression against mother. Now, when I say he, you can use she. When I say she, you can use he. Clear gender pronouns are interchangeable. Half of all narcissists are women. You could easily say that the narcissist's mother mortifies him. She shames him in public. She humiliates him with her absence, with her neglect, or with her smothering and pampering him. She breaches his boundaries. She doesn't allow him to separate from her. She treats him as an extension of herself or as an object. She objectifies him. She instrumentalizes him. She uses him to realize her unfulfilled dreams. She insists to be parentified, to be parented by the child. Or she wants the child to act as a substitute spouse. In all these cases, this creates enormous frustration because the child is not allowed to develop and become himself. There's a process of mourning and grieving over unfulfilled potentials. And all in all, this is the first time the narcissist experiences mortification. Now, you remember the rule of mortification? The narcissist never hovers, never hovers someone who causes him mortification. That's one of the main reasons the narcissist never returns to his mother in order to settle the accounts, resolve early childhood conflicts, and somehow gain clo closure because she mortified him. But on the other hand, mother is an illegitimate target of aggression. It's not okay to hate mother. It's not okay to be violent with mother. It's not okay to aggress against mother. So this aggression remains pent up, unexpressed. And what the narcissist does, he redirects it. He redirects this aggression that by all rights should have been directed at his, at his mother, at his real mother. He redirects this aggression at mother substitutes. It's not okay to attack mother. It's not okay to confront mother. It's not okay to punish mother. It's not okay to be angry at mother because mother is all good. Mother is a saint. Mother is a Madonna. The child needs to believe this because the alternative is too threatening. If mother is bad and neglectful, the child may die. So the child needs to idealize mother, to render her all good while he becomes all bad. And so his aggression, his rage, his, his hurt, his, all his negative emotions are redirected from the real target, which is the mother of origin, to a mother substitute, you, the intimate partner. The narcissist tries to accomplish separation by proxy. 
he attempts to become, to individuate with a mother substitute that is safe. The mother substitute is not a full-fledged clone of the original mother. She is not a replica. And the big difference is, while it is not legitimate to be aggressive with real mother, it is legitimate to be aggressive with mother substitute, with a maternal figure, with an intimate partner. So the maternal figure, the intimate partner, the mother substitute, the maternal figure in the narcissist's life allows him for the first time to express his frustration, his anger, his hurt, and this way to separate from the intimate partner who is a second mother, to separate from mother by proxy, vicariously, and then stand a chance to individuate. Now, individuation is not about becoming an adult. It is about becoming an individual with boundaries, with a self, a constellated, integrated self, with an ego. And one of the main functions of the ego is reality testing. So the ability to be in touch with reality, to realize one's boundaries, to learn from reality, to evolve via fri friction with reality, via defeats, via failures, via losses. So individuation is critical to the process of becoming you, developing personhood, what we know euphemistically as a self. And it, is, it has nothing to do with adulthood, because it starts much, much earlier, at age 36 months, actually. What the narcissist does, he reframes his real mother, known clinically as the primary object. He reframes the primary object, his real mother, by splitting her. In his mind, she is either all good, a martyr, or she is all bad, an evil witch. Correspondingly, he is either all bad, a grandiose monster, or all good, a grandiose victim. So I'm going to repeat this. In early childhood, the child does not allow himself to see mother the way she is, realistically, dead, dysfunctional, a bad mother. The child is terrified to acknowledge this, because if mother is bad, the child stands a chance of dying. The child is dependent on mother for shelter, for food, for care. If mother is bad and neglectful and, and, and absent, that spells death. So initially the child doesn't allow himself to see mother realistically. He idealizes her. He, could, he makes her an all-good object and himself an all-bad object. And this is the famous bad object that I keep describing. I keep referring to, alluding to. Typically, bad mothers encourage the bad object of the child. They keep telling the child, you are unworthy, you are a failure, you disappointed me, you let me down, you don't love me, look how much I'm sacrificing for you, I'm a saint, I'm a martyr, and, and so on and so forth. So the dynamic is two-way. The mother encourages the bad object of the child thereby elevating herself to sainthood, to an angelic position, which the child concurs with. He sees her as all good. When the child grows up and becomes much older, there is a reversal. The child, especially if the child had become a narcissist, the child will split the real mother, the mother of origin, and will see her as all bad will see her as all bad, and then he will see himself as all good. So she would become a monster and he would become a victim. Throughout the narcissist's life, he oscillates and vacillates and alternates between splitting views of his mother. Melanie Klein called it the bad breast and the good breast. Get your minds out of the gutter. So splitting views of the mother accompanied by splitting views of oneself. When she is all good, the child is all bad. When she is all bad, the child is all good. 
And of course, this gives rise to narcissism because the child tries to compensate by distancing himself from himself, by creating a false self and then redirecting everything to the false self. False self is like a buffer, a firewall, a shield. And by developing grandiosity. Grandiosity is a compensatory mechanism. Whenever the narcissist feels all bad, whenever he adopts the bad object as his self-image or self-perception, whenever he has inferiority complexes, whenever he feels ashamed, whenever, whenever he's humiliated or mortified or narcissistically injured, he has this defense. He has this defense of grandiosity. So the narcissist splitting is grandiose splitting. He is either a grandiose bad object, totally bad, or a grandiose victim, totally moral, totally good, total hero, total rescuer, total healer, total savior. And all this emanates from the work of a pediatrician who later became a child psychologist. It's a very similar trajectory to Donald Winnicott, who started off as a pediatrician. And as I keep saying, the overwhelming majority of contributions to psychology were made by non-psychologists, people with no academic degree in psychology. Mahler is no exception. She made her discoveries and her contributions when she was still a pediatrician in charge of a kindergarten. She observed children for many, many years, and then she had a whole team observing children for decades. And these were her, her conclusions. She said, interpersonal relationships become internalized within the ego or the self. So she was a proponent of object relations within ego psychology. She married the two. That was her major contribution. I mean, Guntrip and Winnicott and, and Fairbairn and others, Bion, Bion, Bion and others, they all said the same. But she really came up with an integrative, coherent, cohesive, sensical, even commonsensical framework. And she said, the self... The ego, what we call the self, what we call the ego, that's simply a reflection of our relationships with others. And all clinical manifestations, all mental health disorders, or mental illnesses, are problems with interpersonal relating. They're relational problems. They're problems of object relations. Now, separation and individuation is the name she gave to a process and it is a process of creating internal maps of the self and of others. Later, this would be called a theory of mind and an internal working model. So she said, when we interact with people, as, even as children, even as infants, even as newborns, we keep creating representations of these people in our minds. And these representations are not just reflections, I'm thinking passive, passive reflections. They are maps. They are navigational. They contain relevant and crucial information which helps us to interpret the world, to make sense of it, to imbue it with meaning. These experiential maps, these internal representations, are constructed through interactions initially with mommy, with mother, and other caregivers. And this is between uh, birth and three years old. And of course, when you interact with other people, you're likely to have positive experiences, but you are as likely to have negative experiences. And what do you do with that? How do you reconcile the fact that the same source the same person, the same object, gives you good experiences and then gives you bad experiences. Mother feeds you and then she refuses to feed you. She frustrates you. 
mother is in the room, makes you happy, you're smiling baby, then she leaves the room, he abandons you. It's a bad thing, bad mommy. How do you put good mommy and bad mommy together? According to Mahler, it is the ability to integrate frustrating and pleasurable aspects of experience with another person. This ability to integrate is what we call a stable constellated self, an integrated self. An integrated self includes negative and positive information in perfect balance, equilibrium, harmony, homeostasis, call it what you want. The negative does not impact on the positive, the positive does not impact on the negative, there's no bias. And because there's no bias, the self is stable and is able to tolerate fluctuating, dysregulated, labile emotional states within the self and also within others. Mahler assumes that all of us experience a modicum of dysregulation. Sometimes emotions are overwhelming and a modicum of lability. Moods and emotions cycle ups and downs. But if we have a stable core, a core identity and a self that takes into account the negativity of life, losses, for example, frustrations, inability to control what others would do and think. If you have such a self or such an ego, you'll be okay because you'll be able to stabilize yourself. You'll be able to regulate yourself. But the inability to integrate negative and positive aspects of experience leads to psychopathology. And that's not only Mahler, by the way. Other scholars such as Pine and Bergman said the same. Now, Mahler divided the, the phases before, the phases that precede separation and individuation. She divided these into two stages. One is called the autistic state, and the other is called the symbiotic state, which I've mentioned in many other videos. Now, we no longer use these terms. We no longer use the term symbiosis and so on. So if you use it in university, you will never graduate. You have been warned. But I find um, I find Mahler's work generally brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I think she is one of the neglected giants of giants of psychology, together with Freud and Anna Freud and so on. I think we we have committed a crime against ourselves, crime against ourselves, by abandoning the vast, rich literature that these people had created based on observations. Mahler had observed children more than all of us combined. Anyhow, autistic state and symbiotic state precede separation individuation. And even the process of separation individuation is broken down to sub phases, differentiation, practicing, rapprochement, and on the road to object constancy. Now I'm going to describe all these, all these phases and stages. So stay tuned. I just want to say that Separation is clinically defined as the emergence from a symbiotic state with the caregiver. When I say caregiver, in 99% of the cases, it's mother. So when you, the child emerges from the symbiotic state with mother, the child is by definition separating, but individuation comes later. Individuation consists of individual accomplishments and of characteristics acquired in order to form an identity and don't you worry i'm going to delve deep into i mean this is a deep dive i'm going to delve, delve, delve deep into each and one um, of the of the terms that i mentioned let's start with autism now this is not autism spectrum disorder that's not a neurodevelopmental disorder everyone goes through what she called normal autism or the autistic stage. These are the first four weeks of life. During these weeks, the infant spends most of its time asleep, not aroused, but asleep. Now that's very important. The infant is not exposed actually to the environment, including mother. 
infant kind of isolates itself, isolates itself from the world, from reality, because it's too much. Remember that the infant is exiting, the, the newborn has just exited from a deprivation tank, a place with very dim sounds, immersed in what in liquid, immersed in fluid, and almost no sensor, no sensory inputs. So it's a defense, avoiding the world, isolating oneself, shutting one's eyes, um, going to sleep, essentially. It's a defense. In a way, you could say that the newborn is defending itself against overwhelming fear, terror, the terror of the new world that it finds itself in, and a resulting depression. So the infant creates this closed system. And because the, infants, the infant barely opens its eyes, except to eat or something, the infant can't tell the difference between in and out, internal and external, inner and outer. The infant is protected by what Mahler called the stimulus barrier, a protective shield against overwhelming stimulation by a new world of colors and sounds and moving and motion and objects and so on. So the baby, I'm talking about the first few weeks of life, the baby focuses on internal stimuli, very primitive ones, hunger, defecation, elimination, bodily functions, bodily comforts. The life of, the, of this kind of infant, the newborn, is as Freud had observed, focused on satisfying needs or and or reducing unpleasant, uncomfortable tensions and feelings related mostly though to internal states. So whatever the baby does, he eats, he defecates, he urinates, the baby does not interpret these actions as an interface with the world. The baby interprets these actions as something that is happening inside, internally, not externally. When the caregiver, the mother, satisfies, gratifies, meets, caters to the baby's needs, the baby is happy, the baby is smiling, the baby, feel, the baby feels pleasure. And it is out of this, out of this experience of gratification and pleasure and being taken care of and being catered to that the infant begins to differentiate good and bad. Good experiences are pleasurable experiences, comfortable experiences, experiences the baby wants more of. Bad experiences are painful experiences, frustrating experiences, uncomfortable experiences that the baby, of course, naturally wishes to minimize. But all these experiences and attendant feelings and even glimmers of planning for the future, I'm going to behave in a way that maximizes pleasure and minimizes displeasure, is a way of planning for the future. All these are still isolated. They're islands. There's no bridge. There are no bridges between these islands. They're not linked together. It's not a peninsula, these are islands. There's no sense of self that, that is the glue that cements all these experiences together, makes sense of them, provides you with an identity. None of this. And of course, similarly, there's no perception of the other as a separate, coherent, cohesive entity. It is at this stage that the baby begins to attach. Attachment is an intense emotional bond, especially with the mother. Attachment is the initial glue, the rudimentary thread that begin, begins to connect experiences with a specific entity, the mother, although the, this entity is still perceived to be internal. 
it is as if the unitary inner world of the child breaks, fragments, and there's a mummy fragment and a me fragment. And so the child begins to realize in a very blurred and fuzzy way, as if the child were drunk or on drugs, the child begins to realize that there is something called mummy. There is something like mummy, mother, but mother is still an internal part, a shard, a fragment of the child. And yet the child begins to interact with this fragment. And so this, create, this consolidates the child's experiences around a theme, the theme of mother. It's, a mother is like a classification system. The child says, this experience is, for example, when I defecate, this or urinate, this experience has nothing to do with mother. But when I eat, when I smile, and when I'm smiled back, back, when I'm held, when I'm hugged, this has to do with mother. So part of me has nothing to do with mother, and part of me has to do with mother because it is mother. There's a part of me that generates pleasurable, good experiences and bad, negative experiences, but somehow these experiences occur only when I interact with this part of me that I call mother. So the child begins to get attached to this part of himself which he identifies as mother. He attaches to caregivers and develops the capacity to attach to other people later in life, which is the absolute foundation and precondition for mental health. The absence of attachment-seeking behaviors, such as smiling at mommy, reaching out, anticipatory nursing postures, and so on and so forth. When a child, when a baby doesn't display these attachment behaviors, doesn't try to trigger care and nurturance in his caregivers. That's a problem. It's usually a result of constitutional or basic cognitive deficits that interfere with the infant's ability to organize experience. And so the absence of these behaviors is tied to some problem in the environment or some problem in the baby. Either the baby is cognitively impeded or impaired that's one option. And the other option is that the environment is not conducive to attachment. There's a lot of stress in the environment, or the mother is seriously dead in the metaphorical sense. There is no feedback that allows the child to develop the necessary attachment style and attachment behaviors. This is the work of Rutter, R-U-T-T-E-R. Children who are unable to form attachments or whose attachments have been ruptured through separations, abuse, etc., these kind of children are withdrawn. They suffer from depression. This is the work of Spitz. And so you see that the initial phase, the autistic, the normal autistic phase, is a defense against depression. Because when the child exits the normal autistic phase, tries to interact with his environment, although he mistakes the environment, he believes this and this the external environment is actually internal, but still he tries to interact with the environment, he tries to develop attachment. If this doesn't work well, it results in depression. The autistic phase is a anti antidepressant. And so during this period, we see, in case of failure of the autistic phase, failure of subsequent attachment, we see many clinical, clinical issues emerging, for example, anxiety disorders. There's a sense of loss of self. Or, conversely, um, a wish or an attempt to deny any differences between self and other, merger, fusion, Enmeshment. This is the work of Pine. It's a failure to establish attachment, an attachment uh, leads essentially 
to what we later know as psychopathy. The roots of psychopathy are extremely early in life. And they are probably the outcome, psychopathy is probably the outcome of cognitive deficits in the child. And a depressive stance as a reaction to the constant failure to attach and to find loving figures and caring figures in your life. The child does not elicit because the child is defective, deformed, problematic, has cognitive deficits. The child fails to elicit love and caring in caregivers, even in his own mother. The child becomes a psychopath. So it's not only a problem of attachment, a loss of self, an inability to tell the difference between oneself and others, perceiving others as your property, as your extension, not as separate entities with any rights. So there's a tendency, inability to keep, to keep rules, antisocial behavior, a lack of empathy for others. And yet there is still a deep craving for attention with an inability to form lasting relationships to satisfy this craving. And I refer you to early work by Bowlby, more or less at the same time as Harvey Cleckley wrote his Masks of Sanity, Mask of Sanity, Bowlby wrote seminal, Bowlby wrote seminal works about the emergence or development of psychopathy in very early childhood. So this is the autistic or normal autistic phase. It gives place seamlessly to what Mahler called normal symbiosis. The normal symbiotic state, it starts on the third or fourth week of life and it is because sensory processes have, uh, be, have uh, become much more complex, much more mature, and much more attuned to the environment and much more realistic. They reflect reality much better. It's like the senses are honed, are honed by the, the contact with reality. So now the infant begins to show increased awareness of the outside world. There is something called alert inactivity. The child is like frozen. It, it's very reminiscent of a post-traumatic post reaction, like a freeze, you know, the freeze reaction uh, of, of CPTSD. The child is traumatized, of course. Birth is traumatic. Encountering the world for the first time is traumatic. The fact that there is a part of you perceived as mother who can be frustrating and negative and uncomfortable and unpleasurable, that is traumatic. The child is immersed in trauma throughout these first few weeks of life. And yet he's developing an awareness of the outside world. So what he does, he freezes, the child freezes and scans the world passively. His eyes, you know, his eyes dart from one side to the other. He kind of takes, takes in the world without acting on the world. And this is known as alert inactivity. And during this period, there is an increased responsiveness to the caregiver. The caregiver becomes what we call an auxiliary ego. The caregiver at this stage, the symbiotic stage, takes on two important functions. External regulation. The caregiver regulates the child's internal behavior, internal processes. So the mother regulates the child's moods. The mother regulates the child's emotions. And if the child gets stuck at this stage, this kind of child, having become an adult, would always look for external regulators. He would always look for other people to regulate him, to stabilize his moods, to regulate his emotions. Borderline personality disorder, for example. Borderline she looks for an intimate partner who would fulfill this early maternal role of external regulation. So this is what the mother does. This is one of the functions of the mother during the symbiotic phase. Another very important function, the mother becomes the world. The mother fulfills ego functions. And one of the main functions of the ego or the nascent ego is reality testing, is the ability to discern reality to realize its externality, to act in it and on it in a self-efficacious manner 
that guarantees favorable outcomes. Now, mother brings the world to the child. Mother is the world. She becomes the world. And in this sense, she serves as an auxiliary ego or proto-ego, if you wish. Memory traces of these first interactions help the infant turned toddler, turned child, turned adolescent, turned adult. These memory traces of these initially first interactions help this kind of child tell the difference between inside and outside. And this is a major failure in pathological narcissism, in psychotic disorders, where the patient is unable to tell the difference between out there and in here, external object and internal object, internal object and external object. Everything is one, everything is blurred, everything is oceanic. It's almost a state of nirvana, if you wish, but in a bad sense. There's a feeling of dissolving. The narcissist experiences constant dissolving, like being diluted in water, like losing oneself, like being ephemeral. A very famous painting, Galatea, by Salvador Dali, where you see a beautiful woman's face dissolving into molecules. That's a constant state of the narcissist. Because the narcissist is unable to tell the difference between inside and outside because he got stuck at the symbiotic phase. He never separated. We'll come to it in a minute. Okay. To summarize, these are the roles of the mother in the symbiotic phase. Number one, external regulation. Number two, reality testing. At this stage, there is something called mutual cueing. Mutual cueing is when the caretaker, the mother, selectively responds to the infant's needs. She sets up a process of interpersonal relating that leads to the development of a core concept of the self. This is the work of Führer. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't invent this name. This is the work of Führer in 1963. F-U-R-E-R, -E to be clear. The social smile is another concept in Mahler's work and, and, and later. Social smile is a developmental milestone. The social smile is when the child smiles back at mommy. Why is the social smile so important? Why are we so excited about it? <laughs> Let me get a drink before I tackle this uh, ornery issue. Don't you just love my $10 words? Okay, Shoshanim. Social smile is indicative of two very important developments. Number one, attachment. When the baby smiles at mommy, it's a sign that he's attached to her. And number two, acknowledgement that mommy is external. The baby smiles at an external object. The first time the baby acknowledges that he is not the world, that there's something out there, and that a smile can communicate with that outward something and motivate her to be to be nice so the smile is also manipulative but in a good sense clinically disturbances in care as we say a dead mother or an absent mother by the way could be also absent physically she could be sick she could have died you know inconsistent care leads to deficits in the organization of the self when such care is not stable, predictable, reliable, determined, not arbitrary, not capricious, when, when care is induces a sense of secure base, safety and stability, the child evolves to become a well-balanced adult. But when the care is the opposite of all these things, infants precociously develop their own resources defensively. And this is what is called the false self. The false self is a statement. It says, I don't need you. I'm self-sufficient because I'm godlike. I contain everything. I am everything. I am everyone. I am all-powerful. I'm all-knowing. I'm perfection. So I don't need you. The child rejects 
the inconsistent care and start to self-care, to administer care to itself via the agency of an imaginary friend in a paracosm. This imaginary friend is the false self that is Winnicott's observation in 1953, a pivotal moment in understanding narcissism. Attachment is affected when there is difficulty in establishing what is called self-object differentiation. Differentiation between self and object, in here and out there, me and them. I stop here, the world starts. The world stops here and I start, aka boundaries to some extent. So self-object differentiation, when it fails, this creates enormous difficulties later in life because such individuals lack a core sense of self. They don't have a unitary, integrated, constellated self. And they manifest a defensive detachment to others. They reject other people, they push them away. They would rather be hated than loved. They would rather be abused than taken care of. They reject any dependency on the kindness of strangers, of others. There is low self-esteem compensated for by a grandiose self-structure. And this is known as pseudo self-sufficiency. There's an inability to create any meaningful connection with other people because there's no practice with attachment and no practice of telling external from internal. So the child, later on the adolescent, later on the adult, the child knows that it's hopeless. He will never be loved. He will never be taken care of. He is incapable of forming long lasting relationships. So why bother? Anyone tries to get close is perceived as manipulative or pitying, pitying, humiliating, or stupid. If anyone tries to come close to a narcissist, she must be stupid. Or she must be manipulative, she's a gold digger, she's looking for something, or uh, something's wrong with her, she herself is mentally ill in some way, or, or, or. Narcissists would invent a million explanations why it's wrong for you to love him. And if you do, it's threatening because he is incapable of managing this. And so here we come to separation individuation. Separation, you remember, is the exit from the symbiotic phase. And it starts with a subphase known as differentiation, also called hatching. Hatching. It is four to ten months of age. Hatching, differentiation, psychological birth is the phase when the infant differentiates out of the symbiotic unit. It's been described wonderfully by Pine and Bergman, among others. It is characterized by an alert state. So there's a transition here from alert inactivity to alert activity. The child acquires agency. The child begins to operate in the world and on the world as an agent. So there's an alert state with distinct periods of wakefulness and even, I would say, hypervigilance. At about six months, the infant begins to engage in exploratory behaviors of the caregiver. And this is called as customs inspection, uh, <laughs> tongue in cheek, customs inspection. The child pinches the mother's nipples, her cheeks. He shoves a finger up her nose. He bites her lips and her earlobes. That's his way, child's way, of exploring this monolithic, monumental thing <laughs> that is out there and is the source of his negative experiences and positive experiences alike. Child starts exploring, first and foremost, the mother. This consists of visual and tactile exploration, not only, not only touching or probing, but also looking at, at the caregiver, at the mother's face and body for hours. It's a kind of peekaboo game, physical separation through crawling away, venturing back, playing near, nearby mommy, mommy, pretending that she's not there, 
the child is beginning to dabble in separation, taste it, experiment with it. And throughout this process, the infant engages in visual checking back. He, he plays around, he separates or attempts separation, and then he panics. There's an anxiety reaction. And the child checks whether mommy is still there. The visual checking back. It's a developmental function. It's intended to help the child discriminate the familiar from the unfamiliar. And then the child develops something called stranger anxiety. It's again a developmental uh, landmark. It's very important. Stranger anxiety is when the child is able to tell that mommy is known, a known entity, a known quantity, familiar, and all the others are not. And that includes father, by the way. All the others are not. So all the others are strangers and they provoke anxiety and mother reduces, ameliorates and mitigates the anxiety. The mother's function as a secure base, her ability to regulate externally the child's anxieties and moods and emotions, allow the child to venture into the world and take the risk of becoming labile and dysregulated because he can always run back to mommy and she will re-regulate him. And gradually, the child transitions from mommy from mother to an object, and this is known as the transitional object. It's a teddy bear or a soft blanket or any other object the child chooses for comfort. It's also known as a comfort object. So the comfort object is very important because it allows the child to separate from the caregiver in a risk-free fashion. The teddy bear will never spank the child. The blanket will never kill the child or beat the child. So it's risk-free. A pillow, you know, a carpet. <laughs> Children adopt the most amazing objects as transitional or comfort objects. But they're all safe. A sleeper, old sleepers, they're all safe. And so it is safe to abandon mommy and to experiment with an object that is not mommy, but is still comforting, utterly controllable, and always with the child, provides object constancy and reduces the child's abandonment anxiety. The, the transitional object represents the comforting functions of the mother, that the infant can now generate from other objects on, his own, on its own terms. The mother is available to the infant during these early attempts at separation. The infant must build confidence a confident expectation and basic trust in the mother. Only, only then is the child capable of developing basic trust and confident expectation regarding the world. It's as if the mother is a recharging station or a safe place to run to if you fail. I refer you to work by Benedict in 1938 and Ericsson in the 1950s. So, if there's a failure at this stage, if the mother is not available, doesn't encourage the child to explore the world, takes away the transitional or comfort object cruelly, is sadistic, critical, harsh, her love is conditional on performance, is absent, dead, selfish, depressive, you name it. If it's a, it's a bad, dead mother. If there's a failure at this stage, this is the root of borderline. So remember, psychopathy starts much earlier. Borderline is a later development. So borderline phenomena start to develop. Borderline is characterized by an unstable sense of self, unstable relationships with others, and chaotic fluctuating internal states. It's a chronic feeling of emptiness, this intense separation insecurity, separation or abandonment anxiety, the inability to be alone for long periods of time, and the constant concern about the availability of others to help manage intense, intense internal tension, external regulation. I refer you to work by Horner. 
So this is the first phase, differentiation. Second phase, subphase. We are in the separation phase, and we are discussing the second subphase of separation, which is known as practicing. It's between the ages of six to 10 months and up to 18 months. So some children are late bloomers, takes them much longer to go through the phase of practicing. It's a shift to autonomous functioning. And, even, and it is also divided into two parts, early practicing and proper practicing. In the early practicing subphase of the practicing subphase of the separation phase, so in the early practicing subphase, which there's a big overlap with differentiation, as you, as you may have noticed, yes? So in the early practicing, the infant is able to move away from mother by crawling, climbing, and pulling itself up and holding on to a supporting object, a ladder, a chair, and so on. Many injuries during this period. During these explorations, the infants check back, check back with mother to emotionally refuel. By the way, that's where I took the word fuel. <laughs> in, my, in my writings on narcissistic supply, I say that narcissistic supply fuels the narcissist. And I took it from Margaret Mahler, emotional refueling. The child looks back at mommy in order to emotionally recharge. If the child is terrified. Will mommy be angry at me that I'm separating? Will she encourage me? Will she still be there when I look back? Will she abandon me because I dare to crawl away from her? So the child needs this constant reassurance from mommy. And it is known as a secure base. The child is reassured about the availability of the caretaker. And here, Bowlby's work on attachment is much more important than Mahler's. During the practicing proper, the infant is, attains, attains certain physical accomplishments. The infant starts to walk. He stands upright. He resembles much less a monkey or an ape than before. He is impervious to injuries and bumps and falls because mummy is there to comfort him and to salve his wounds. This period is the toddler's love affair with the world. There's a sense of omnipotence, uh, newfound skills and functioning. Green care, green care was the first, green care is a name <laughs> of a psychologist, was the first to suggest in 1957 that exploring, taking on the world when you are 10 months old or uh, 18 months old, taking on the world, requires grandiosity. You need to have an unrealistic assessment of yourself and of the world to undertake such a massive, terrifying task. And so Grim Care suggested that at this stage, infants develop a sense of omnipotence, godlike omnipotence. And if the infant remains stuck at this stage, if this, the, this developmental phase or subphase is disrupted, this sense of grandiosity, omnipotence, godlike features, attributes remain with a child as an adult. And these are known as narcissists. Games during this phase reflect a growing awareness of separateness, the need to be reassured of the caregiver's availability for support. So all the games are actually tests. The infant runs away only to be caught by mother. This is a test. Infants play game, games at this stage to explore features of mother and features of the world. Mother noted that children at this age often show preoccupation, a preoccupation and attempt to create a mental image of their caregivers when these caregivers are no longer available. So this constant testing via gamification, gamification of testing, it is intended for the child to accumulate a database of information about mother, so that when mother is out of the room or on a trip, the kid can access this relational database and recreate mother in his own mind. These are the rudiments of object permanence 
to use Piaget's term, object constancy to use Mahler's term. The major shifts in cognition from sensory motor to representational thought and the beginnings of language and symbolic play, they add to the child's increased autonomy in interacting with the outside world. And this is where Piaget's contribution comes in. He actually, his work actually focuses on separation individuation. So what does a child accomplish in this subphase? If this subphase goes right, what are the accomplishments? Well, healthy narcissism. The beginning of a sense of self-esteem fueled by pleasure in one's own abilities and autonomous functioning. So yes, narcissism has its roots here, but it's healthy narcissism. It's a realistic assessment of one's strengths and limitations and the knowledge that mother has your back, you're loved, you're cared for, you're sent out to the world because she trusts you and she will always be there if anything goes wrong. This is a healthy environment. If this phase is disrupted, the clinical issues arising from this level of development reflect problems with premature object loss. Instead of taking pleasure and delight in newfound skills and the world revealed to them, this kind of children worry about the primary object, about loss, about abandonment, about the care that they require. They're extremely insecure, anxious, attached to mommy's apron, unwilling to walk away, unwilling to experiment or to explore. You see this kind of kids in kindergarten, in narcissistic phenomena. There are disturbances in the ability to maintain self-esteem, to regulate a sense of self-worth. Individuals have an inordinate need for outside validation and admiration of their abilities to reassure themselves of their value. So these kind of individuals create an inflated sense of importance. They tell themselves, I'm special, I'm unique, and they feel grandiose, the same grandiosity that they had initially acquired in order to explore the world, they redirect inwards and explore themselves because the world has proven to be unsafe. The mother's lack of availability has rendered the world unsafe. The grandiosity that should have been consumed in exploring the universe, taking on reality and life, this grandiosity is preserved and directed inwards towards the maintenance of an inflated, fantastic self-image and self-perception. These kind of feelings defensively ward off the need for others. The child tells himself, I've tried the world. I attempted to connect with others. This sucks. It doesn't work. I don't know why it doesn't work. Maybe something's wrong with me. Maybe something's wrong with the world. But I prefer to think that something's wrong with the world. I prefer to think that other people are the problem. I'm okay. I'm okay in the sense that I'm perfect. I crave constant admiration and reassurance from people because I still doubt this hypothesis, but this is the working hypothesis. This is what I came to believe. This is the theory that I've developed about myself, the minds of others, and the world at large. This is my internal working model. I am perfection. I am godlike. I am flawless. I am infallible. I am perfect. I am brilliant. I am this and that. The problem is with the outside. How do I know? Because I've tried the outside and the interaction failed. And it could not have failed because something's wrong with me. It has failed because something is wrong with the world. The child refuses to acknowledge that the problem has not been with the world and very rarely is with the child, but it has been with the mother. The child cannot direct aggression at the mother. He cannot criticize mother. He cannot admit that mother obstructed his growth his separation, his individuation, his personhood. He cannot admit to this. So he's left with only two options. Either something's wrong with him or something's wrong with the world. Because mother is perfect. Mother is all good. Mother is idealized. 
at this stage of life. Narcissistic individuals feel, feel entitled and yet they are dependent on other people. They demonstrate a lack of empathy and concern, they abuse, they exploit, and then they demand, they expect. When others disappoint them, they rage. And this seeming contradiction between actions and consequences, antecedents and, 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 and consequences, you know, this seeming contradiction is because there's a missing part. And that missing part is in mother's shape. The child fails to interpret the world properly, to understand reality in life and himself, because he wouldn't introduce mother into the equation. He's protective of mother. She's perfect. She's all good. Indeed, this is reflected in the third subphase known as rapprochement. The period of rapprochement spans the ages of 15 to 24 months. It is behaviorally active. It is actively approaching the caregiver, going back to the caregiver, reverting to the caregiver. Children begin to realize, whenever, when they've explored the world grandiosely, they begin to realize the limits of their alleged omnipotence. They have a new awareness of their separateness and the separateness of mother. In short, the world has broken down. There's a schism in the world. There's a break. A very traumatic break. So, suddenly the child realizes, I'm not one with mother. Mother is separate from me. I'm separate from mommy. And there are many other separate things out there. And so there must be a limit to what I can do. My omnipotence, my primary narcissism, my grandiosity, they were all wrong. I was all wrong. And this creates a sense of overwhelming, dysregulating insecurity lack of safety, lack of stability. And thus confronted with uncertainty and indeterminacy and the threat of the unknown huge world out there, the child runs back to mommy. Rapprochement. He runs back to mommy and he, it is symbol, a symbolic attempt to eliminate the new gained knowledge of separateness. I'm saying, I'm running back to you because I don't want to be separate from you. I hate what I found out. I hate what I found out about the world, about others, and about myself, and about you. I don't like the fact that you are not me, mommy. I want us to be one again. I want to go back to the womb. I want to go back to the symbiotic state. And this is precisely what the narcissist does to you. He encourages, he encourages rapprochement. The narcissist encourages you to give up on the world and on your own separateness and to merge with him as a maternal figure, to go back to the womb, to the matrix. Narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and relationships with narcissists are grounded firmly in rapprochement because the narcissist never attains separation. He doesn't know how to do separation, individuation. He doesn't allow you to separate and individuate from him. He regresses you to very early infancy. He becomes your mother and then he forces you to abandon your own accomplishments at separation and individuation and to regress, to go back all the way to rapprochement. During this phase, in a healthy child, child's life, there are increases in cognition and motor development. And this is known as ambitendency, shadowing and darting away from the care caretaker. The child follows the caretaker like a duck, but doesn't interact with her. When she turns around, tries to talk to him, he runs away. And then he shadows her again, follows her, like in bad, bad B movies. And these behaviors, Reflects the, reflects the child's simultaneous need for autonomy and need for support. The child is hesitant. He can't make up his mind. Does he want to be separate from mommy or does he want to be one with mommy? It's like now the child realizes there's been a symbiotic phase and there is a separation phase. What do I prefer? Do I prefer to remain stuck with mommy for the rest of my life 
symbiotically, or do I prefer to separate from mommy and potentially lose her? The potential to lose mommy is, is shocking to the child. It's traumatizing, it's terrifying. It's a nightmare. And so there's an increase in aggression seen in behaviors such as pushing away, whining, clinging. These behaviors represent the struggle to reconcile the good and bad aspects of the self and the good and bad aspects of mother. The child needs mother, and yet by now he has realized her separateness and the fact that she is not all good. So there are many struggles here. You know, toilet training uh, is part of it. The child is, the child is encouraged to become autonomous and in control over bodily functions. It's a part of, of gaining personal autonomy and independence and separating from mommy. The, the children at this stage become nono bears. They keep saying no. This is a way to test their agency, their power, newfound power. And so autonomy, Erickson called it uh, the, the stage of autonomy. The child doesn't regard autonomy as an unalloyed good. The child is terrified of autonomy. Anxiety is high. He doesn't know how to cope with it. And rapprochement is typical of borderline phenomena which are characterized, as we said, by unstable inner states, unstable relationships, and a fragile sense of self. In borderline phenomena, there are feelings of loss of support, the loss of approval of others, which are maternal proxies. There's aggression, there's anger that arises out of intense feelings of vulnerability, dependency, a failure to separate, the need for external regulation. And the major defenses employed in borderline phenomena are those of splitting and projection. Splitting keeps the good and the loved aspects of other people separate from the bad and hated aspects of these very people. So the borderline splits everything the way she splits her mother during the separation phase. Mother, on the one hand, is a secure base, pleasurable and comforting. But on the other hand, mother is very frustrating because she's separate. She's separate. And she doesn't always accommodate the demands and the wishes of the child. So that's very, very bad of mother. That's bad mommy. <laughs> and the borderline carries this attitude forward in life. And when she's not immediately gratified, for example, she uh, devalues, she splits the frustrating object. Projection is used by the borderline to rid herself of felt unwanted bad aspects of the self. The, the borderline attributes these bad aspects of the self, these unwanted parts, these rejected parts, to another person. Now, of course, both narcissists do the same. It's not limited to borderline, psychopaths. But uh, failure of rapprochement usually, usually yields borderline, borderline problems. Internally, because of a lack of integration of good and bad internal representations of the self and of others, individuals with this defensive structure are subject to fluctuating internal states, feelings of disorganization and low self-esteem. The failure of integration and constellation leaves the borderline, and by the way, the narcissist, without a self. Self is an organizing principle. Even if you adhere to my, my theory, based on Philip Romberg, a theory of self-states, there is an assemblage of self-states, a coalition, a consortium of self-states. The borderline and the narcissist don't have this organizing principle. It's all a bloody mess. And it's a mess because of the failure of integration and constellation processes. Healthy people transition from rapprochement to the last phase of separation, known as consolidation of individuality or the road to object constancy. This is the age, this is between 24 and 36 months, and it involves all the aspects of all the previous stages, in particular the trust and confidence of the symbiotic phase. 
There are advances in cognition during this phase. Representational thought becomes the dominant, dominant cognitive mode. And language begins to be used. The use of language mediates reality, but also defines consciousness and defines reality. It is through language that we become aware of ourselves, of others, and of the world. Children have an inner picture of mother and their relationship with mother. And this inner picture has formed as a result of soothing, gratifying, and organizing functions that the mother provides. I refer to work by Tolpin, Tolpin, T-O-L-P-I-N. It is at this stage that the famous mechanisms and processes of identification, internalization, incorporation, and introjection, they take place at this phase. It's a internalization is the process of recovering what has been lost in the actual relationship with the mother. So toddlers create an internal picture of an all good gratifying mother. And this now becomes a part of their internal structure. They carry around an all good mother because real mother is a composite of good and bad. And so she is frustrating and she's the cause of discomfort and unpleasant feelings at times. At this stage, the child needs to carry in his mind an introject, an internal object that represents mother, but is idealized, unrealistic. When, when children get stuck at this stage, they become narcissists. And this is exactly what the narcissist does to you. He takes a snapshot of you as a maternal figure he idealizes you. You become all good in his mind. And when you start to deviate from this image, contradict it and diverge from it, he becomes very angry at you. He begins to see you as an enemy and regard you as a persecutory object. And this leads to devaluation. Back to healthy children. The developmental achievement in this last phase of object constancy or individuality is individual identity with stable internal representations of both oneself and of other people. And this achievement is a condition to forming one-on-one -on -one relationships in the future. Because in every one-on-one -on -one relationship in the future, especially intimate relationships, romantic relationships, love relationships, in the future, when the child had become an adolescent and an adult, there are always problems with separation. Relationships always lead to a modicum, to some measure of merger and fusion and enmeshment. And then there's a need for healthy, a need for healthy separation. But if the child did not graduate through early childhood separation in a healthy manner, the adult will perceive every separation as abandonment and every closeness as engulfment. This is the problem of the twin anxieties in borderline personality disorder. The fourth subphase of separation teaches the child that separateness is not abandonment, that intimacy is not engulfment, that it is possible to preserve in his mind a representation of mother, a representation of himself, that are balanced, that are realistic, that are good and gratifying, or idealized, but not in a way that is, shall we say, that leads to enmeshment or to fusion or to merger. So, individual identity relies crucially, the formation of individual identity, relies crucially on the ability to create internal objects of oneself and of others that on the one hand don't threaten the self with anxiety, internal objects that don't threaten with abandonment, don't threaten with engulfment, don't threaten with enmeshment, good internal objects, mother-like internal objects, but on the other hand, don't deviate too much from reality. 
Idealization can be based on the mother's good aspects, real good aspects. Now, if this subphase is disrupted, there's ambivalence towards mother and other caretakers and their functions. There is, there's a lot of bad feelings and bad blood regarding needs, how needs have been met or have not been met. There is depression associated with the threatened object loss and a sense that important needs have never been met. This is Horner's work. But you can say, wait a minute, Sam, what about fathers? Keep talking about mother, mother, mother. What about fathers? Don't they have a role? I keep being asking, keep being asked this question. Well, search the channel. <laughs> I answered this question. I'm going to answer it again because I'm a really, really nice guy. You can safely internalize and introject me and idealize me. Fathers. Father is much less crucial. It almost has no role in all the phases that I've described. In the early stages of homeostasis and equilibrium, the father provides some complementary um, services or functions. So um, he perhaps shed, sheds light on the infant's behavior patterns. He helps the mother actually. He helps the mother to soothe the baby, to regulate behaviors, to stimulate the baby one way or another. But it's like mother has 90% of the job and father has 10%. During the symbiotic period, the father is totally absent, clinically speaking. He is available as another love object, a secondary love object. He adds depth to certain experiences. He serves as a litmus test, kind of a, a, a checksum, <laughs> you know. So the child loves the mother, and then he, he tries out his, his, his love or his cathexis, his emotional investment. He tries it out on his father. It's like a second, uh, second, secondary test. The father engages the infant in interactive ways that complement the mother's comforting functions, but they are not critical or relevant or, or integral to or incorporated in separation individuation. During the practicing phase, fathers become more significant. They become the significant other and they help, help to modulate aggression. They provide a secondary blanket or secondary layer of security a base to return when the toddler can't find mommy for some reason. But the toddler would always prefer mommy to daddy. When the toddler ventures out and experiences and explores the world, he will always run back to mommy. It's as if daddy is not there, totally transparent. There's, all, there's of course, much later in life, let's say around three years, there's the question of gender differentiation. The father provides a gender for comparison and identification, gender differences. The father is available during the rapprochement. He helps the child to organize and modulate feelings of frustration and aggression. He helps emotional and cognitive growth. The father is totally auxiliary, secondary. It is a fact, and I'm sorry, it is a fact, that children who grow in, in fatherless families are absolutely okay mentally. Father is not critical to healthy emotional and psychological maturation. Fathers teach skills. Skills. Father teach social mores and conventions and sexual scripts. Fathers are agents of society, they're agents of social socialization, but they are not psychodynamic agents. They are not psychodevelopmental agents. They are not even neurodevelopmental agents. Father can set limits, for example. He can support autonomous strivings, but can limit them to appropriate behavior. He can signal when the child transgresses. He can punish. He can help children tolerate and integrate ambivalent feelings. Uh, fathers play an in interaction with children is more active and more exciting, but it is the mother who is soothing and comforting and it is the mother which is who is the engine of development. I mean, personal development, psychological development. Uh, the experiences of personality differences, 
between father and mother gives the infant varied, varied experiential environment that allows the infant to be more fully expressive of emotions and participate with others and so on. So Burlingham, those of you who are interested, Burlingham has written a lot about the father's role. Muller's theory was promulgated in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So it's old, it's old, but it's based on numerous observations and it's still very solid. Over the years, there's been a lot of critique of Muller's theory of separation individuation, especially from the field of infant and attachment research. I refer you to studies by Lyons Ruth and Stern, one of my favorites. Infant research demonstrates that infants are pre-wired for relatedness from birth. They do not experience an autistic or symbiotic phase, say some of these scholars. From birth, Stern, for example, says that from birth, infants experience subjective sense of self and a subjective sense of others, from which experience is organized, structured and restructured according to cognitive and affective developmental levels. By the way, to a large extent, Fairbairn and Winnicott say the same, only using different terminology, and much earlier than Stern. Attachment theories, they also cast doubt on the validity of the symbiotic phase. Symbiotic phase is very doubted today, so we don't use it anymore. Attachment theories pointed to, the, to infants' readiness to interact from birth with evolutionary behaviors, such as crying, sucking, smiling, to elicit caregiver attention and care. Bowlby's work goes into this. I think there's a confusion here between reflexive empathy and actual empathy. Reflexive empathy and attachment. Reflexive empathy and separateness. I think there's a lot of confusion in regarding reflexive empathy. Even today, in the study of empathy, uh, people say the narcissist has cognitive empathy. Wrong. The narcissist has both cognitive empathy and reflexive empathy. And this is why I coined the phrase called empathy, because it includes these two variants of empathy together. There are points of convergence between Mahler and attachment theories. The concepts of internal working models, self-other representations, these all these are all rewordings and rephrasings of Mahler. Early relationships become internalized and form expectations of relationships in general, even in attachment theory. I refer it to work by Maine, Kaplan, Cassidy, and others. Mahler's concept of emotional refueling and Bowlby's notion of secure base, they're very much alike. They underscore the need for the caregiver, for the mother, to be available during the exploratory behavior of the world. Bowlby and Mahler come to different conclusions regarding the behavioral manifestations of the underlying psychodynamic, but I don't think they are too different when it comes to the psychodynamics itself. Mahler sees the practicing and rapprochement phases as characterized by active separations, with ambivalence towards reunions with the, with the mother as a threat to the emerging autonomy. Attachment theories disagree. They see this period as an increase in the awareness of and interest in the mother's availability during exploratory behaviors. Ask me, this is hair splitting and nitpicking, in my view. These two can be easily combined coherently within a single framework. Infants seek proximity to mothers during the exploration of the world, period. This is not clinging, this is not ambivalence, this is not aggression as described by Mahler, this is attachment. On the other hand, ambivalence, aggression and clinging do exist. Who can deny this? <laughs> Any mother would tell you that this is true. Attachment theories say that clinging, ambivalence and aggression are problematic interactions between infant and mother. They characterize problems in the quality of attachment. Tyson and Tyson, for example, Lion Wood. I disagree. I think these are perfectly understandable and healthy reactions to a situation which is very terrifying, very frightening, very unclear, very unfamiliar. 
I'm going to abandon money. I'm going to explore the world. Oh my God. It's an oh my God reaction by the baby. By the child, it's a baby. Attachment theorists forget that it's a baby. So I still stand by Marlon to a large degree with modifications by Bowerby and others in my work. And I integrate it with Bromberg's self-states. Okay, I've done my best to give you in-depth background to my work. I hope this helps. And I wish you all um, separate and individual weekend. And don't interject me too much. And if you do, watch my videos about eradicating the narcissist's internal serpent voice.